I should be live. It should be an accent. Hello. Let's see. Let's put that into that. And I can do that. Hello, Carl Magus. Well, hello, Runon. Hello, Peter Dilson. Hello, John Shea. Hello, Nazi K31. Hello, Team Locker. Hello, Paul Emmers. Hello, Seven Cretton. Hello, Mark Harkness. Hello, Mikey Cooch. Hello, Paul from Chicago. <coughs> Right then, hello everyone. Now, two things. One, I'm sorry I'm not going to be on Discord like I normally am after a Thursday Live this evening, but that's because one of the reasons why this is late as well. Um, I stayed till in the hospital. My mom's being admitted. And at the moment, she hasn't been transferred to a ward where we have to leave her at 8 o'clock. So what we did instead was my sister stayed, and my sister went home, had some food, and then came back took over from me, and I've come and I'm doing the live. I've had some food before I did the live, please note, that was included. And I'm going to do the live, and then, because of course I'm the one who sleeps the least out of the two of us, after live, I'm going to have probably a quick shower, and <laughs> then I'm going to go back to the hospital, and I'm going to send my sister back home, and hopefully she's going to get some sleep, because she needs it. So, hello everyone, and yes, so the live will be... Fairly prompt this evening, probably. But I did. Let's put it this way. Hello, very silent miss. Hello, uh, silent mouse. Hello, Joss Funk. Hello, Frank Bowen. Hello, Tobias. Um, and hello, Timmy Loku. And Wayne. And Jonathan Burrow. Hello. I was told very clearly by my mother I was not supposed to miss the live because. As I've explained in one of the videos coming up, I'm not sure which one, but I think it, would, I think it might have been Texas. Um, my mum. To an extent, blames herself and my and my basically taking a gap in my career to help her when she had cancer for some of the lack of progression in my career in terms of getting a permanent tenured post. I've told her it's more the fact that her son is an intransient <clears throat> who won't change from being an able historian and the whim of some uh, to whim of some senior academic to being whatever's fashionable this week when they're apply asking me to apply for a post. Um, I'd say that's more at fault than anything else, but we'll leave that to one side. My mum tries to blame herself, and she's very worried that I will do that. I will end up somehow tanking the YouTube channel um, if I keep putting up recorded videos to cover for me not being able to do the video, uh, do the videos, and missing videos. And um, she's very worried about that. So, A, thank you to everyone for your kind messages. I do keep repeating them to her to try and explain to her that it's unlikely to happen. And B, I'm under orders to be here. And I'm under orders to do it as well as I can do. So I will do. I'd also say that currently I am thinking I'm going to be doing far more of my liquid consumption in the office than I ever have before because... Um, my poor mum's just been put on one litre of liquid only a day as well as the treatment. <laughs> this is a woman who... You all think I drink a lot of iron brew, right? My mum doesn't drink iron brew. My dr mum drinks coffee. My mum drinks Ribena and she drinks water. And the doctors were calculating that she drank somewhere in the region of six litres of liquid on average a day. And they decided that might be a little bit too much for her. <laughs> Whereas this was sort of sitting going, we hadn't realised it was quite so much. Uh... <sighs> Hello, Dan. Oh, and by the way, Dan, um, the doctor today said whoever had advised us to go to a doctor in Cornwall when she was unwell had possibly saved her life because of the things that had got wrong. He actually phrased it as saved her quality of life because if her legs and everything had been allowed to go on much longer, if it hadn't been for the catches they made in Cornwall, which led to them making the catches they have in Epsom, would have been, as she would have been in real, real trouble. So um, I think if everyone in the chat can say thank you to Dan, that'd be very kind of you, because frankly, I don't think I can say thank you enough by just saying thank you. 
Yeah, watch out, Dan. <laughs> There's a doctor in Epsom who's very worried about uh, about the things. Go Reds. Okay, that makes me worried. Who am I supporting? Thank you, Paul, for Chicago. <laughs> yeah, it's basically they were just looking at going. As some of you will know, who chatted with me about my mum and her issue of her legs, um, they've been inflamed for about the last since about 2016, and that's what's causing her the trouble because the inflammation finally got infected, and it's meant they've gone back and gone. Hang on, she hasn't had the test on done since 2018. Now it's quite understandable because what happened in 2019 was of course COVID and all that stuff, so lots of things got put to one side, but. Um, yeah, it hasn't been, the ball hasn't been picked up since COVID. And that's the trouble, because no one's been monitoring it. So um, Dan, when I sent him a picture and said, is this something I should be worried about? And went, get out of hospital. Yeah. <sighs> so. Thank you, everyone. Now... If not Pearl Harbor, if not Pearl Harbor, wh what's this all this question about? Because one of the things that teaches you a lot about history is looking about what are the other options they pick instead of Pearl Harbor. Now, interestingly enough, I couldn't find my lecture notes when I gave this lecture about five years ago in a university setting. And I gave this as a lecture to the students to challenge them to think about the, stra the decisions Japan was making and how much we can learn from their level of thinking and their decision-making process by what they do pick. Because as I've tried to say to them, and as I'll try and show you today, the actual logic which means they select Pearl Harbor actually works against the logic which guides them to doing Pearl Harbor in the first place. The very conception of their operations which leads them to doing Pearl Harbor, the very conception of it, actually shows that Pearl Harbor is the bad choice to do. Because whilst you can, you can theoretically make a big, big gain, you can't actually deliver what Japan wants from it. That's right. What was the point of it? It was a mistake to attack the place in the first place. Well, we're going to get into that. We're going to get into that. But this is the thing with Pearl Harbor. It's a very... It can be a very divisive topic to talk about. Because it can also be a very emotional topic. And I'm... So I'm going to preface this with saying... A lot of people die. And really they shouldn't have. Nothing I say today, or in this video, should be taken as denigration of them. Because today we are discussing this from purely from the perspective of the Japanese planning criteria and strategy. And the reason that's useful to learn about is because what I think happens there, and I will ask you all at the end about this, is that planners get locked into a certain target a certain perspective. And at no point do they think their way around it. At no point do they think, is this really what we should be doing? Is this really sensible? At no point do they sit there and go, are we doing the correct thing? And that's the problem. And Frank Balmore, you're quite right. I haven't actually included the, the Panama Canal in this, mainly because of the distance from Japan to Panama. <laughs> actually, I'm just going to put this in. Interesting enough, the reason my mum has a if people just said mums fill the water fund, she's an adult match at the maximum liter of liquid a day, and so far they're sitting her on Lucas Aid because they decided that will help her. Then you sit there and go, why she's got low sodium. She's low salt. 
Lucasane. <laughs> Just drink that. You're allowed two bottles of that a day. That's your entire liquid supplement. Oh, I, tr I tried to offer her a litre of iron brew. She wouldn't take it. Just, I'm gonna, I'm share my iron brew. Let's get into this. But uh, she was, remember it, while I was saying about Panama, the reason I've crossed out Panama is because of distance. Okay, so I've kept it to within roughly, roughly the distance of Pearl Harbor, so 4,000 nautical miles. That's roughly it. So the targets have got to be roughly sort of that area or have got to be practicable. So, you've got to be able to have land masses where you can have refueling and safe refueling within range. Primal, there are many ways you could have attacked Panama. We've dis I've discussed this on this channel before. Uh, the, my preferred methodology would have been a cruise liner or freighter loaded with commandos. Just have it appear going into the Panama Canal. And you could have organized that quite easily. You could have organized that very, very easily. Japan has enough similar looking ships. You could have had one that was supposedly a freighter leave um, the UK bound for Panama and to come through that way, across the Pacific that way. And that to disappear down the coast of Africa and through the Indian Ocean. While another one which was, which had come up, which looked similar. It, and so it's heading from the UK. It perfectly sounds and looks exactly like it. It's actually loaded commandos, and they go into the locks and blow them up. And they could blow them up as they went through. They could literally get through a set and blow it up. And just do damage the whole way along. Thank you, Alistair Shaw. So, my book, I will say, uh, everything is kind of taking a hit of the next book's coming at the moment. I mean, seriously, moving house and this with mum. Um, they will come, but when they come, it will be, it'll be definitely spring next year. This is, this is not happening in January. It's not happening in December. It's just not happening because it just isn't. So hey ho. But thank you everyone who's buying the second edition. Thank you everyone who's been looking at it. It's really, really kind of you and it's really helping. And Oh, good lord. Seriously, we have a free health service in the UK, but by the lord are our car parks expensive. <sighs> so, why was Pearl Harbor chosen? Well, quite obviously, it's in the middle of the Pacific, pretty much. And it's a massive American geostrategic asset. It hadn't yet reached the base air level complex it would in World War II. But it's got a lot of facilities there, it's got a lot of airfields, a lot of capabilities in terms of the harbour, a lot of space, and it's a perfect play launching pad for a fleet to cross the Pacific. So it's a brilliant location. And it's therefore, it's the hub of US naval operations in the Pacific. So it's an obvious place to attack. It really is. You could argue maybe too obvious. You could also argue that it's stretching them completely because if you attack there, you're going to immediately put the, Amer the enemy on a defensive to an extent. They might try and launch an offensive, but they're going to be on a defensive because they're going to have to seek to defend their territories. And is that really what you want to do as Japan? Do you want them on defensive? Do you want the Americans on a defensive for your fo focus on warfare? Sure, move to Wales. Free parking. There's also free parking in Cornwall. <sighs> Sorry. <laughs> mm. uh, 
My one question was, wasn't the problem that the idea of using cruisers to destroy submarines to wear out the advancing force relies on the Americans rushing to the Philippines for the Philippines Pearl Harbor forces, the Americans to stay in harbor and repair and gather their forces, making it hard on the Japanese? We'll get into all that. We'll get into all that. Hello, Malaga. And hello, Alistair Shaw. I'm not sure if I said hello earlier. So, Pearl Harbor is an absolute mecca for the United States Navy and the United States forces. It therefore becomes rather an obvious target. It's kind of like attacking Singapore in terms of Britain. It's the obvious place to go after. The fact is that both Britain and America hadn't really defended their meccas uh, as well as they should do is neither here nor there. In the American case, it's a part-time radar and all sorts of other issues. In the British case, it's that Singapore, the fact they'd put all the money to build the infrastructure and basing facilities in Singapore, but hadn't put the money to build the, build the proper defences, and added on, hadn't, didn't have a proper command structure in place. I would argue that they should have had a separate command structure who was um, command of defence of Singapore, kind of like they had at Gibraltar underneath the area commander so that instead of the general who was in charge of the entire Malaya etc being also directly in charge of defense of Singapore there was someone else whose job it was to plan and sort of set it up and have a staff doing it and that staff to have existed in peacetime so that they could have just literally so it didn't matter if they were the A team the B team or the C team in terms of rolling that British forces staff officers they would have had enough of the A team building up the plans prior to war that they could just slot for units into those plans and run them. That, that would have been a sensible thing. Yeah, my sister keeps nicking my mum's blue badge for the possible parking. <sighs> so, let's consider how Pearl Harbor was carried out. How was it carried out? Well, it's carried out under a lot of operational control. There's a lot of, there's a lot of quietness going on. Now, you see there's Enterprise and Lexington wandering around and where they're sort of, they're up to and what they're doing. But more importantly, if we think about this, where they are in terms of the timeline. On the December 8th, Lexington is far to the south and uh, west of where the uh, Japanese are launching their strikes from. And... Similar, on the 7th of December, they are still to the south of southwest of them. And, frankly, Enterprise is lucky where she is, because she's just about far enough away, she doesn't get spotted. And considering she was flying off her air group during one of the strikes, and they sort of, they're almost coming in at the, at the time of the, in the, the attacks... That's that's not a good position for her to be in, in terms of her air group and air defence. Nathan Cook, how much of the threat did the Japanese consider that force in the Sunnis? Not much of anything. Honestly, they're capable of defensive operations only. So... The Japanese, as you can see, do a very interesting kind of route. A very interesting route. And if we consider they're actually getting closer before they disappear off. And they go back on the southerly route. They came on the northerly route. Now that gives them a good advantage coming in. The southerly route is slightly quicker. Slightly quicker from a sea perspective than the northerly route. But it does also give them some advantages. In terms of less likely to be spotted. Because the Americans were very much expecting someone to come directly at them. I don't know why. I don't know why the Americans thought the opponents would be completely simple. But they did. They did.
It's on. Short of having the time to watch the carriers carefully. So many times went as well as well as they could. I, yes. Well, it went as well as, a, as they could hope if they were hoping to strike at the US Navy. But was that what they were trying to do? Code 85. The other big choice for your major US fleet port was Manila. But US was limited by treaty upgrade at port and was in the middle of, m middle of pulling out of the Philippines when it all started. Yeah, Manila is always another option. Ooh. Anyway, let's consider Japanese doctrine. And I'm going to expand this a bit. Because, well, I've done several videos on Japanese doctrine, including the Kantai Kesson series of videos. So I, I'm not going to go into this perhaps as much detail as I was planning on before the events of this week. But please note, there are videos you can go and I will I discuss it in quite a lot of detail. Kantai Kesson is an important column doctrine in a Japanese, naval, a Japanese operational doctrine. It, that's the, the Yohei, uh, Yohei Koru. It features in some form every year in the annual operations plans, the Nendo Sak uh, uh, Sakusun Kyoko. It's even a major feature in the justifications written into the Kokoboro Shoyo Hairako, uh, uh, the, aka the military strength requirements for national defense, which is, of course, a key factor in the Taiko Taikoku Koko, uh, Kokubo Hoshin and the Tekuhoku Yohei Koryo. Which are the Imperial Defense Policy and Imperial Defense Doctrine. And yes, they are different documents. Important documents, but different documents. Now, the thing is, the Kansai Kesson Decisive Battle Doctrine becomes much of a political animal. And therefore, often people, when they're trying to look at things, are looking at Pearl Harbor, etc., and thinking it's some form of Yogeki, it's some form of Kantai Kesson, when actually it's not. It's more from the Yogeki Sakusan and the Yugeki Sengen Sakusan. Uh, that's the ambush strategy and the interception and attrition operations. The ambush strategy is all about attacking the enemy where they least think you are going to. And the interception and attrition operations are exactly what the Japanese prescribe for dealing with a more powerful enemy. You sucker them closer and closer to the home islands. You attrit them on the way. And then when they get close and you have reached parity or near enough parity, maybe even superiority in force, then you go and engage them in a Kantai Kesson, i.e. in a decisive battle. You, uh, this is the point about the decisive battle doctrine. People often go, they're looking for a decisive battle. They actually have a whole prelude that they want to do before they do a decisive battle. And believe it or not, they have a precedence for doing this because look at Tishima. Look at the prelude of that. They don't need to go and wear the, wear the, uh, the Russian fleet down. The Russian fleet wears itself down coming around the world. It's great. But they have that as their doctrine, as their idea. So, yes, they might be seeking a decisive battle, but they're seeking a decisive battle in their terms. Pearl Harbor's not a decisive battle. I've talked about the Philippine Sea. is not really a decisive battle. It's possibly the closest you get to one, but it isn't really. Because ideally they want a decisive battle to be as close to the home islands as they feel safe in having it. For their own support, and so they can bring maximum force to bear. Again, like the Battle of Tsushima, where if you consider how close that takes to home islands, that's really, really frigging close. So they can bring maximum forces to bear, and the enemy can bring minimum forces to bear because they're at the maximum length of their logistics line. Which preferably has been snapped in multiple places. That is the Royal Navy's plan. Uh, that is the Imperial Japanese Navy's plan. And do us many others as well. So, yeah. This means that we don't want to talk about the Kantai Kesson when we're talking about Pearl Harbor. What we want to talk about is what I just mentioned. Yugeki Sengen Sakusen. Now, I know I've said it was also part amber strategy. That is uh, Yugeki Sankusen. But honestly, Pearl Harbor strikes me more and more as I look into it as an idea to try and get the Americans to charge into the Western Pacific 
to charge in as hard as they can and hopefully end up leading to a Kantai Kessen where the Americans have been attracted to the point at which they are equal or lesser in strength than the Japanese. Now, this is where things get interesting. Because if you look at the, the admirals of the US Navy who were in charge of their fleet, not a single one of them was stupid enough to charge in. There are many people who make remarks about Halsey, etc. They're not stupid. They're not going to charge into a trap. If they were losing ships, they'd turn around and go home and build more. They might lose their job, but they're not going to be stupid enough to wipe out their entire force. And the thing is, again, it is kind of um, Carthaginians versus Romans in that they would probably go and build a new force and come back again. That's what they do. But leaving that all to one side... If we consider this is the starting point of the Pearl Harbor strategy, Pearl Harbor is terrible! Think about it. You go in and cripple their battle fleet, all the damage you do, so they can't do this. So they have to wait till they've built up more forces to come. This is, this is the base, and this is the logical, strategical basis for doing Pearl Harbor. The logical strategic of this is to, to make America so angry because you attack their territory. And the Japanese are not stupid. To make them so angry, so passionate, that they come out stupidly attacking Pearl Harbor whilst it might theoretically uh, be make them angry enough to do it. It's also going to damage them so much they can't do it. Moronic, it's also the reason, to an extent, why Nagumo probably holds back the next, the third, and the fourth wave. Because he's already done more damage than he intended to. More damage than quite a lot of them believe possible. He's both done not enough damage for Yamoto's perhaps other plan, which is Yugeki Sagugasen, which is an ambush strategy where you were supposed to be decisively destroy your enemy in detail with an ambush but done too much for this so the two potential strategies which this could be launched at if you can go into sort of four waves that could have potentially done so much damage to the american fleet in terms of loss of numbers yes the japanese would have lost more aircraft yes they'd have lost they've had their own losses but the americans could have lost so much that they would have been in a Put back probably another, I'd say three, four, maybe even six months before they would were they were actively engaging the Japanese. If they've lost enough ships and enough people have been damaged, it could put them back that much back even further. Because you see, the thing is, it's one thing to have some battleships but not be using them because, frankly, you don't have the fuel, so you're making the choice to use our aircraft carriers. But if you have all your battleships destroyed or sunk, so you have access to none. Suddenly they become this mythical weapon. Because if you think about it, if they're all destroyed, that shows that the Japanese were really scared of them. And therefore they're really powerful. So they've done all this, and it's underhand tactics, remember. It's underhand because they attacked without provocation, without warning. So they did all that. You, you can hear the arguments now. So that would mean the Americans have probably slowed up completing the Iowas and the Montanas. Honestly... They'd probably be trying to complete both as quickly as they could. It's... it's an issue.
And this is the, uh, the final point, really, because for us to consider Pearl Harbor in its reality, we have to pick one of these strategies as the key strategy for them to pick for it. And the point I would make is that the intention, although there was a mucking up on timings, the intention was to tell the US, uh, tell the US declare war before they hit. Which, considering the moment you've received the declaration of war, everything gets ordered to maximum alert, kind of makes an ambush strategy... It's still theoretically it, but it's not really as likely. In fact, you could argue that the being alert and then being hit will feel will because the more the Americans survive and they'll feel more confident because they've just survived being hit would actually have fed into the intercept and attrition operations because it would have given them a full sense of confidence to go charging out under. What about the strikes missing the fuel dumps and oil storages? Again, that's the whole thing. Um, it's the third strike. Nice to go from, I think they do the second wave. It's the third wave they don't do. So, inferring from all that, my base points are, we're looking for a target which can lure the enemy forces to come out charging at them, and it's got to be within roughly 4,000 nautical miles strike range of Japan. Now, this is where things get interesting. This is where things can get very, very interesting, because there are a few options in this. There are a few options. San Francisco, I've added there, it's not within 4,000 nautical miles of um, Japan, but it's worth it. Because if you hit it, the Americans will definitely come charging for you. Also, considering the major base is at Pearl Harbor, if you have your submarines sitting around Pearl Harbor, when the fleet comes charging out to try and intercept the carrier group on its way home, you could have some merry times with them. Anchorage, Alaska. The, it has almost no military significance, no political and, and no strategic significance in terms of military capabilities. But in terms of political uh, political significance, striking an anchorage, which is roughly 3,000 nautical miles away from Japan... Oh, yeah. That's going to... That would cause some trouble. We have Singapore, of course. That's within range. That hits the Brits. There may that there isn't a fleet really there, but that, that that hits the Brits, and so the Americans are then going to make a choice whether they jump in the war or not. You know, you can avoid, you can theoretically make it so that the Americans are actually debating whether to join the war. And while they're debating joining the war, you can do all sorts of nasty things by massing your forces against whatever exists of the Commonwealth forces in that area. Similar to Sydney, Australia, it's actually slightly more difficult to get to, but not that difficult, not impossible. And again, it's going to cause all sorts of issues. It's not really the base of Singapore. It's not really sort of worth it as much, but it's something to consider. 
I think I've skipped the Philippines, but you can all guess why you attack there, because if you want to make the Americans come charging across the Pacific to try and defend the Philippines, the best thing to do is to attack the Philippines. Of course, the other option is to not attack at all, to declare war and just sit and wait for the Americans to come. So we're going to go through all these options. We're going to consider them all. Now, let's see. Um, that's true. That's an interesting question. If James Sullivan had had a carrier fight with Kido Batai, even if he had been sunk, they wouldn't have gotten away clicking me. This might have forced a different op option. Um, honestly, it wouldn't have changed. It would have been after Pearl Harbor, but it might have changed things to do later in the war. A lot of things later in the war. Uh, honestly, if the Kido Batai fight the Royal Navy, as I was discussing with Jamie in the second part of the video, will probably come out. It'll probably end up being Friday's video, tomorrow evening's 7 o'clock video, I have to make the second part. I know some people said it's quiet, and I've played it through myself on my phone on 50% volume, and it was fine. So I'm not sure why it was quiet, but I'll leave that to one side. Um... It's a fairly long, you know, if you do get to the scenario of fighting the British in the Indian Ocean, if the British do launch their strikes at night, especially considering they have radar-guided strike aircraft, there is, a, and considering the Japanese capabilities in terms of fighting uh, fighter and air defense at night without radar, the Royal Navy could knock out two or even all five of the carriers that are on this Operation C if they go for it and risk things to do so. In which case, you have a very interesting scenario. You also could theoretically end up with a scenario where there are four Congos fighting HMS Warspite and two R-Class battleships. With Warspite probably shouting something like, FOR REVENGE OF REPULSE, MY FELLOW WORLD WAR I VETERAN! And Renown probably steaming up from someone behind going, For my sister! While the two R's are going, Okay, we're doing with the Nutters. <clears throat> They're both insane. We, we'd like it to be noted that we are orderly, fine, professional battleships. <laughs> Did they just fire at us? Okay, that's it. We're ramming you. <laughs> R-class battleships. They're thoroughly professional right up until they get the chance to go and ram someone. And then they're after it because, you know, they... they there, the R class's hero is HMS Dreadnought, and as we all know, she didn't ever. She, the only vessels she killed in combat were submarines, which she rammed. And from that point onwards, the R class were thoroughly committed to the idea of ramming other ships. Although they were tried to not do what King George V did, which was ram a uh, ram HMS Punjabi, a tribal class destroyer. So, here we go. San Francisco, California. It is the longest range strike. And if you want to attack, annoy America, you really do want to strike at American soil. Hitting Pearl Harbor achieves this, but hitting San Francisco is going to achieve this even more. Because San Francisco is a important place. It's a major port. It's a major hub of industry. And more importantly, it's a major cultural hub for America. They look to it. It's a, it's a whole time in terms of what San Francisco is to America at this point. Attacking it is going to cause them upset. It's going to cause them outrage. And it's going to cause them to ask and demand a lot of political... Uh, there'll be a lot of political fallout from it as San Francisco being attacked. If you want to cause America to go apoplectic, you attack them. We have seen this in history repeated several times. 
if you consider that you know one of the reasons what uh, one of the reasons brought up why uh when it was being discussed and this is according to a book which i've read which hasn't been published yet but they have got sources for it um when it is published you'll all know about it because i'll be telling you to go look at it it was looking into the scenario of why america handles the debt of britain post world war ii the way it does and why it suddenly started it suddenly cancels things and some of the people involved were still making jokes about the War of 1812. 130, 130 something years later. Um, which I, I, I hope. I hope those people weren't as powerful as the book would suggest. It's a well researched book. But those people seem to have more informal power than form power, so I hope they don't have as much power as that book suggests they do. But we'll leave that to one side. The point is, America does not forgive if they're attacked. And if you want to make them charge at you almost stupidly with all their forces, then you've got to go straight away, and you've got to go above the Navy to the politicians. Because let's be honest, the politicians have a habit of getting rid of admirals in the U.S., who aren't agreeing with them. If you want a good example, look at all the predecessors of Nimitz in charge of the Pacific Fleet. It's about three of them. Look at what happens to them. Look at how they're treated because they cross Roosevelt. They disagree with him. Now imagine you have got a Roosevelt who staked his reputation on quick and swift justice being brought to the Japanese. On the fleet going to Tokyo and pummeling them. That fleet will be ordered. And the orders will not leave room for interpretation. And he will make sure he has an admiral who will do that. An admiral who is sufficiently motivated. San Francisco is a far more exposed target than Seattle and Portland, and also it's a far bigger target. Seattle is not as big and important as it's going to become during World War II and after. So we're talking what's important in 1941. What's important in 1940 41 when they're planning this? San Francisco's up there. Um, discussions going on about Renown and Warspite and R-Class. Basically, the scenario has it that um, instead of going home after losing their carriers, they try to hunt down the Royal. Na they try to hunt down the Royal Navy carriers, and so they run into Warspite and the two R's holding the line between the carriers and the British carriers and the and them. And probably with the aid of strike aircraft going in as well, attacking the Congos. Renown is, from memory, the clo next closest capital ship so, uh, during Operation C. This is from memory. And so I added her in joining and uh, turning up. Because let's be honest, Renown has a habit of turning up near, near where action's going on. Um, but I haven't looked into that one dramatically. I, I should probably do, go and chart that properly and work out where exactly any any supporting capital ships could come from. San Fran over San Diego. Literally because while San Diego is probably the better military target, San Francisco is the more important target. And you want to... Remember, you've got to make... the You've got to outrage the Americans into attacking you senseless, senselessly. You've got to make them attack you senselessly. And San Diego is not going to do that as well as San Francisco will.
But my questions, would the US IGN Air Forces be able to hit the dams around San Francisco? They could, in theory. Whether they have anything that could damage those dams is a different matter. Uh, you have to remember the Royal Navy tried to use torpedoes on Italian dams on a couple of occasions and didn't always have the greatest success with it. That's why the Royal Air Force ended up going down the whole route of developing the bouncing bombs rather than just using torpedo bombers. Next option, and probably the easiest, is Anchorage, Alaska. You have all the advantages of attacking American territory without actually having to face any threat at all. There is literally nothing there to oppose you. Honestly, they could have capped this off by doing an amphibious assault using their troops into Alaska, and the Americans would have been absolutely... Mm. Look what happens in the Aleutians. There isn't much better back in the rest of Alaska. And it's it's a really difficult place for the Americans to actually reinforce and operate up there. Now, the one big problem for them, though, is if they do anything in Alaska, they're probably going to end up having to fight the Canadians. And please note, everyone, before we get into this, the Canadians have never committed war crimes. That's because it only becomes a war crime after they've done it and someone sees what they've done and starts writing it down. Okay? We love the Canadians. They are lovely people. But honestly, their history in combat is one of a people who really want to get the war over and done with very, very quickly because they hate being this nasty. So they will do whatever they think is necessary and justifies being necessary to get it over and done with. They, they haven't committed... The, the thing is... How do I put this politely? They... Have never committed crimes which have ended up with them going to court. Because, as said, they do the things. Then it gets declared illegal. And then others do it as a sort of um, un inadvertent homage to the Canadians. You could almost argue. Um, we love them dearly, but some of the things they've inve they've brought to warfare. Let me put it this way: behind that niceness and that all that repression that gives them, it makes them seem so nice, etc., is obviously, I would say, a lot of pent up rage, a lot of pent up rage, and possibly some very very scary imaginations. Uh, I'm not sure, but I, I'm, I'm all very glad that Glyn Stewart writes science fiction rather than horror stories. Because, frankly, if you put the same level of effort into a horror story, considering what's probably hidden within his very nice exterior as a Canadian... Oh, good lord, that would be giving the world... That would make Stephen King have nightmares. I'm sorry, I thought the reason was for bouncing bombs was, was torpedoes, was the existing torpedo nets. Actually, it wasn't as much the torpedo nets as it was sinking down to the base of the dam to go boom. Because they found that when they hit it... The reason the torpedo nets were in place was because the Royal Navy's attempts on the Italian dams. And they had caused damage but not destroyed them. So the British knew they had to have a bomb which would sink down to the bottom of the... Um, the out of it. And you couldn't necessarily do that with a drop bomb. <laughs> By the way, the Soviets didn't like playing against Canada in the hockey at the Olympics because we were too violent. That doesn't surprise me. I've seen Canadians playing hockey. I've played, actually, a game against Canadians playing, against a Canadian team in ice hockey. I've played ice hockey on a couple of occasions. And I've played against Canadians, one of those occasions. And the Canadians were some of the team, it was a, a joint Canadian-American team. And honestly, the Americans were... The Americans were nice compared to the Canadians. The Canadians were lovely... The Canadians were nicer off the rink. As people to approach to, you know, they were chatting, happy to chat, all, all sort of nice and smiley. The Americans were game face on. The Brits were all going, we don't do this regularly, so we're just, this is just, we're just here for fun. 
Everyone else is being very serious and we're going, okay, this could get problematic. Luckily, we had a game of rugby with them afterwards, a few days later. We got our own back. <laughs> anyway. Michael Phelps, given Japan's serious deficits in oil reserves, they haven't taken the Dutchies in this yet, wouldn't any tight use of Pearl Harbor be outside the results of that hand? Well, the thing is, Alaska is only 3,000 nautical miles away from Japan. It's actually closer to Japan than Pearl Harbor is. San Francisco is further away, but you probably would send a smaller force. You wouldn't need to, let's be honest, there aren't as many targets around San Francisco. What do you need to hit and what do you want to hit? Becomes a question. So you could actually might be pulsing two carriers and a set of six carriers. So you could probably do that. Um... <laughs> uh, it's fun, but if you attack Anchorage, well, you do one. You do three things to the Americans. One, you make them paranoid about the defense of Alaska, so they're going to pour a lot of resources into that. Two, they're going to want to go and attack you because you just attacked their home territory, so they're come, going to come charging you. And three, you give them the impression that you're very weak because you've gone after one of their weaker spots, so they think you don't think you're strong enough to go after anything stronger. That's the uh, that's the idea. We, you're again, again. That's what's going to be uh, politicians. We're thinking more likely than the naval officers. Most, Canadians make up most national hockey league players, even the American teams. When Canada loses the Olympics in hockey, it nearly sparks national inquiries. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I was a fairly decent prop forward in my day. The trouble is, as McDavid just pointed out, the, the trouble with hitting Alaska is there's not much there. So whilst you can hit Anchorage and take it out, there's also the small problem that you hit Anchorage and take it out, the Americans might not realise you've hit Anchorage and taken it out for a few days. They're going to be really annoyed when they hear about it, but it's going to take them a while to hear about it. So, you know, you, you might end up having to do more. In the nicest way, you might end up having to take some troops up there and actually do a landing in Anchorage, as said. Um, you could maybe go for... You can maybe try and launch a strike on Fairbanks as well. Uh, honestly, the American force up there are so small and weak in 1941 that, frankly, it's going to be traumatic for them. Now, Nathan Cook, if not Pearl Harbor, does Kimmel stay in position? How does it affect the war? Kimmel's a fairly good admiral. He's a very good admiral, actually, in many ways. And if you can't have... Uh, uh, it's a case of they offer it to Nimitz first, Nimitz turns it down, then Kimmel's offered it. So Kimmel is not a bad admiral. And please note, I've done a whole video about Kimmel and, Re and Pearl Harbor. And if he had been given the correct... In he'd been given the same information as his predecessor, he probably would have been... Um, prepared very differently. But the thing is, he is shafted, to put it politely. And if he had been in charge, he is more aggressive than Nimitz. He was trying to organise a counter-strike from the moment he got a hit at Pearl Harbour, but I don't think he's reckless either. I just think maybe you might actually see him trying to command from a fleet to sea. He might well try and take. He might well try and command from one of those battleships and and take uh, take the entire fleet. Yeah, if you've got the Manchurian army to send a detachment of troops to Alaska, then it would not have been good for the Americans, considering their forces there. They are not supported, they're not well, they're not well supplied, they're not well supported. It's just not a good scenario for them.
Again, I also remember that Arankanish is because of the place it does, because it's where you can fly to Japan from Europe and USA to get around Russia, the Soviet Union. Yep. Short didn't do Kemal any favors either. No, we'll leave that to one side. I ain't got the Philippines. This is actually the most obvious one to attack. If you want to get America to do something stupid, but don't want to do anything which will actually, uh, you know, but don't feel like attacking American territory directly and want America's fleet to actually come up to sea. Because here's the big problem with attacking Pearl Harbor. As my good friend and very excellent colleague, Drakinafal, has shown with his series, uh, series just last year, you can repair or rebuild ships which sink in harbour. They do. He's got an entire video come out today, I think, on the ships which were recovered from Pearl Harbor and how they were put back into service. You just... Sinking them in their home harbour doesn't help. Sinking them at sea where they can't be recovered, where their crews can't be recovered, that helps. You know, it, it, that sounds very nasty to say. That is absolutely atrocious to say, if you think about it from the American personnel perspective. But from the Japanese perspective, sinking those ships at sea where they can't be recovered and their crews can't be recovered is far more sensible than sinking them in harbour. So in Alaska, land troops had a very bad time due to well-armed irregular troops. You have to consider the Alaska population of today is not the Alaskan population of 1941. Okay? There is a big difference between the Alaskan population. And the fact is, the Alaskan population of today is slightly denser in terms of, num of uh, its population but it's, uh, in, it's slightly denser in terms of both its geographic spread, but a massive amount denser in terms of its numbers. Whereas in that period, there really isn't a lot, and if you're prepared to do some nasty things, like the Manchurian army were, frankly, there's not much that Alaska happens, ha that bears out. Bourgeois, can you imagine the USA's response to war crimes on US soil? I can imagine, but the thing is... The Japanese were planning on winning. And the idea goes, in this form of strategy, is that if you make the Americans charge across the Pacific, they get their fleet wiped out, their behinds handed to them, quite literally. Then... They're lost. Then, quite simply, the Americans are lost. That's their plan. They are... Ignoring to extent the fact the Americans will rebuild the fleet. That if they sink a fleet, okay, it'll prolong the war for two more years. Because let's consider that. The, um... If the, so if the Americans... Let's say the Americans charge across in 1941. Not 1941, 1941, but early 1942. January 1942, whatever forces they have available, charge across. They've taken a couple of weeks and they're now charging across the, Atlantic, uh, across the Pacific. And they get attrited and they keep on going because of political pressure. And they keep on going and they keep on going and then eventually they get destroyed. What are the Americans going to do? Well, A, they've got whatever ships they've got still which weren't part of the main fleet which were sent. B, they've got the Atlantic uh, in the Pacific. B, they've got whatever forces the Atlantic they retained in terms of their personnel. They've got all the forces they're mobilizing and they've got all the ships they're building. 
And yes, to form a viable fleet is probably going to take another two to three years, but they're not going to have a fleet in the for, pretty much for that time. Interesting enough, that probably changes things in terms of British deployments. And that could be really interesting. How the British react to that, to the American fleet getting snookered. Um, you might see it, it, it it's going to sound, this will sound again, slightly strange. But the potential is, especially if a Europe first strategy is taken, still, that you get defensive forces deployed into the Eastern Fleet and you get reinforcements go to any Eastern Fleet which the British set up. But the Americans sort of are almost in a holding pattern. And focus on uh, focus on building up the fleet and doing the operations in Europe with the support of the Royal Navy until about 1944 when eventually enough of the Royal Navy is free to partner up with the US Navy to go back to war. And the thing is, you lose out on all those big naval actions which you would have had. Guadalcanal campaign, etc. Because they just don't have the fleet there. They just don't have the fleet to do it. Uh, I mean, most of the crew of the Arizona were not recovered, yes, but sadly enough, that's the outlier. That's where everything that can go wrong does go wrong. Most of the other crew, most of the crews of most arrests were. Fun. It seems like a dumb plan to me. Equally, I suspect that if two sides actually talked to and understood each other, they wouldn't be at war. The trouble is, every time they talk to each other, they seem to talk at such cross-purposes and such misunderstandings that actually they made the situation worse. The US and Japan's relationship in from about 1890 till about 19... I would argue 1945. Um just gets worse and worse and worse and more and more misunderstanding and even to an extent I would argue to this day having worked with some American diplomats I would argue that a lot of them still do not understand Japan. Japan's been forced in many ways by the end of World War II to learn to understand America but there is still a large section in my experience of not just actually American, please notice I would add in others, who do not of diplomatic services who do not understand Japan and the subtleties of Japanese. Um, this is something I was, I've been very lucky in some of my colleagues at King's when I was doing my PhD and some of the people I have had the pleasure of working with in since my PhD and even actually going back to my master's in having a lot of discussions with people who were, uh, and a lot of working, spent time spent working alongside and with people who were Japanese and who were Chinese and who were Taiwanese and Vietnamese. And the big thing I've taken away is that all my reading, all my learning hasn't even captured a small fraction of the nuances and you have to work within that you have to work within that understanding that there are subtleties and nuances to their thinking and their thought process Sure. Wait, if Alaska got hit, will we have to move stuff to the Vancouver Island? You have to move all sorts of stuff. But anyway, getting back to the Philippines. If you go for the Philippines and combine it with the amphibious assault on the Philippines, so you have your huge force doing that, well, in many ways, A, you're going to speed up the assault even more. And frankly, the assault in the first place was pretty 
terrifically overwhelming. And secondly, and this is probably the most important factor to think about, you're going to make it even more likely for the Americans to charge towards you because, well, they've got to relieve their forces in the Philippines and they've got those forces, so send them. They've got a full mighty battle fleet. They've got a full fleet. Send it all. Send everything. And if the Admiral turns around and goes, no, we can't send all, we don't have the fuel, which is actually one of his problems. There's a reason he doesn't have the ships out at the... He only has the ships he does have out at sea is because he's having to rotate them because he doesn't have enough fuel. Kimmel doesn't have enough fuel. Pearl Harbor has been chosen as the forward fleet base, yet Pearl Harbor has not been invested in to have the facility, necessary infrastructure and support to be a forward fleet base. They're still building it. Paul from Chicago, bringing in the cat girls. It's always the cat girls with you. Seriously. Seriously. Always the cat girls. As a Mitchell, KFC convinced the Japanese that the KFC is a traditional Christmas meal. Eh, let's go. Mike Phillips, unfortunately, most of the US lead diplomats are people who contribute vast amounts of money to presidential campaigns, not people who may be able to do the job. I would say that's more the case in countries where they don't care about the diplomatic representation. There are some countries which are critical enough that they do care, that they do make sure the people there can do the job. But also, usually, I am talking about, when I talk about the senior diplomats, I'm talking about people who are like the charge aid affairs, etc., who are the... Um, who are the career diplomats in the building? If Japan attacks the Philippines faster, MacArthur has a higher chance of being captured or killed. Anyway, a lot of improvement on the American war effort. It would be interesting, because with the sheer amount of firepower they could bring with them, that would seriously break some things. They have interesting policies. Now, attacking the Philippines does also have the fact that it actually plays into several of the American war plans. That is another advantage. It plays into a lot of their war plans, and a lot of their war plans do include a fleet charging to the Philippines to recover it. Interesting enough, uh, War Plan Orange has slowly been working back on this fact. Politicians have kept trying to push it, push it for a faster and faster fleet response. And the Admirals have kept finding reasons to slow down the response. The reality? The reality? This would be an ideal operation from the perspective of trying to draw the Americans out. However, it's not going to get them sufficiently angry that they're going to be charging without thinking. The Philippines, even killing MacArthur, wiping out the US Army in the Philippines in force, or, you know, basically taking them all prisoner or killing them all, that's not going to have the same impact as attacking American territory. It just isn't. It's annoying to say in that regard, because for a lot of people, that would be a focus point. You know, Philippines, that's got to be something they've got to defend. But no, it's not something the Americans are going to feel that they have to defend. It's something the Americans are going to want to defend, but not feel they have to defend. They're going to feel that they want to go for it. They want to recover it. They're going to go for it. 
but they're not going to be as push speed wise. And remember, if you want to do the attrition plan, they've got to be coming on emotion, not logic. Attrition doesn't work on a logical opponent. Think about it. Attrition works on an emotional opponent, not a logical one. A logical one will look at the numbers and go, attrition doesn't play my way. I'm losing too many forces. I will pause where I am, hold where I am and rebuild forces, or I will withdraw. An emotional co uh, opponent is the one who thinks, we have right on our side, we will carry on. That's an emotional response, not a logical response. And what the, um, uh, what the Japanese need from the Americans to try and win out of Pearl Harbor, or out of this scenario, is an emotional response. That's for sure. Split attack, four to the Philippines, two to San Francisco. You could do that. You could split your forces. You could even do two to Philippines, two to San Francisco, and two to Anchorage. To really wind up the Americans. But um, the thing is, if you're going to do that, that's going to be a lot of logistics. A commando style raid is not going to get the response. Think about it, Blackbird Maximus. What is a commando raid automatically? It's automatically sneaky beaky. It's a long range submarine, it's a few commandos. Yes, it's scary and annoying, but it's not going to cause them to send the entire fleet. You have to send a fleet. This is part of Pearl Harbor. Part of the thing that galls the Americans of Pearl Harbor, part of the thing that really winds up, is that its fleet gets so close to them all to track. It's not a covert operation. It's not a sneak operation. It's a fleet. It's a fleet they sent to sink our ships. Let's see, if I say samurai, most people think of a warrior. However, not all samurai are bushai, warriors, and not all bushai are samurai. Confuse yet? Mm, I'm not, but that's because I've studied enough and was uh, very, very lucky in that one of my colleagues for an entire summer of teaching in Cambridge, teaching on a summer course called The Future of War, uh, one of my colleagues was a very nice Japanese gentleman. And, um, well... I would say he was the one who had the greatest tolerance of alcohol out of any of my colleagues. And I, of course, can drink soft drinks till kingdom come. And every time the staff went out for an evening's enjoyment, he and I would sit on a corner table and watch everyone and check everyone was okay, while I basically drained a, pl a place of coke or iron brew, depending on which place we went to, and he slowly worked his way through their very fine whiskey and scotch collections and trying to educate me on the differences between the two. At which point, at some points, I did remind him that part branch of my family does own a distillery in Scotland. But, um, yeah, that, 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 <laughs> that was... That never seemed, he never seemed to believe that I actually knew anything about what I was talking about, considering I didn't drink. So he, he was always a trying to educate me. And um, I learnt a lot from it, because his family are old, old samurai. Uh, in fact, uh, they are they were never affiliated to the clans. They were always um, Bushai of the uh, the royal family. And as such has a very interesting family history. No, no, no. Graham Hunter, so you're saying that the analysis in the prep of the doctrine and what they did was not necessarily as it should have been, therefore, thereby didn't get response I wanted. Yeah. In an ideal case, one begins attrition at the point where the retreating forces can be attrited further, provided that your harassment forces do not get don't get popped. True. Maximus, but think about trying to organize those commando raids. A, you need a commando force that you can insert by submarine. 
B, they need to get into America, and then they need to get from where they are to those to those dams. They need to be carrying enough explosives. They need to do it all without being found. And also, you're talking about Los Angeles, where, as well as the army, you've got to deal with the police forces and all the other uh, scenarios going on around there. That's quite a population-dense area. And uh, there are issues with that. Same with hitting San Francisco might have been a the unfortunate possibility of being intercepted and destroyed by Pearl Harbor Fleet on the way home. It might have also caused the Pearl Harbor Fleet to come out, in which case, if you had a load of submarines around Pearl Harbor, they wouldn't have to be trying to sneak into the harbor because the Pearl Harbor Fleet would come out, and if they came out and found the submarines, then they could be getting themselves sunk quite quickly. Again, think about where the attrition can begin. My thoughts, wasn't the fleet factor more because of the time it took to get there? Japan is negotiating with the US while at the same time sending the fleet. Negotiations are not in good faith. They weren't really negotiating. This is one of those often misunderstood things. There's ongoing normal diplomatic contacts and discussions. But people often try and say they were negotiating this, that, the other. They didn't have a war, so they weren't negotiating a peace treaty. They weren't negotiating really anything. They were ongoing diplomatic sessions. There was no, uh, in the nicest way, though, the Americans were dictating that they, the Japanese shouldn't do the X, Y, or Z in, in China. And the Japanese were responding and going, no, we have the right to do what we want to do. And it was a whole debate going on. So the Philippines is a good option for getting them to come in the right direction. And they'll definitely come, but they're not going to come angry. Not like San Francisco, not like Anchorage. Anchorage has the option of making them angry but because it's attacking their home territory. But it probably is it's also it's Anchorage, so how much are they going to care? Other options then. Singapore. Well... The problem is it's British. So you attack it. Is that going to upset the Americans? It probably will do. Is it going to cause them to charge absolutely blindly somewhere? No. Is it going to help you as much in terms of attack forces you're likely to find to attack? No, because the most you're going to find there is two capital ships. And honestly, if you find those two and you take them out with six aircraft carriers and four capital ships, then honestly, the whole force zenith will change completely because it'll be a case of overwhelming odds. Not just land-based aircraft, overwhelming fleet versus them. Um, it becomes quite a different myth. Honestly, you attack Singapore. It's in range. You have other issues, though, that can come with it. It's, do the Americans choose to get involved in the war? Do you want them to get involved in the war? Well, they're probably going to have to get involved in the war, but they're going to have to... It's more of a target you attack if you want to cause the Americans to be completely befuddled. Let me explain how that goes. So, the Americans, of course are planning on a war in the Far East. They are planning on it. They've been talking about it for years. They've been far more keen on a war in the Far East than Europe. It's one of the interesting things when people start to tell me about American isolationism and I go, yeah, but have you seen what they're doing around the Far East and how much they're getting involved in issues there? They go, well, the, no, mm -mm. well, the thing is, that counts against isolationism. This is the point when you start going, we're an isolationist. We've got an isolationist policy. I go, yes, you do have an isolationist policy. That's a great thing to have, a great isolationist policy. Trouble is, you're not actually living up to your isolationist policy. You're picking and choosing where you get involved. You don't want to get involved in European issues, but if it's South America or the far or Asia, you want to get involved. You want to tell people what to do. 
And that actually makes your life more troublesome for you than it does for others, because your most likely allies to assist you in telling people what to do are the European powers. But you've turned your back on them and decided you don't want to get involved in them. So that means that your most likely allies are not going to help you, uh, except tangentially when it's in their interests, and when it's directly in their interests, not even tangentially in their interests. And you, you are going to make enemies because you are spouting that you're not going to get involved and then you are choosing to get involved. <coughs> the thing is, if the Japanese attack Singapore, they force Britain to face an issue and Britain has to start you know, mobilising itself, but the Americans are going to probably be spent weeks fighting over what they're going to do. This is going to be weeks when the Japanese can be running rampant on selective areas, while the Americans can do nothing. It, Singapore photo does have an Avro Lincoln in it, um, Peter Dawson. It's f also got some far more wonder ships than World War Two. But the trouble is, I can't find a decent picture of Singapore from 1941. You can find a, de a decent picture of Singapore naval base from 1941, and I have the rights to use it, and I don't have to pay the IWM an absolute frigging fortune to have access to it. I will lovingly and willingly use it, very happily. But the trouble is, at the moment, the only one I can find with free rights to use comes from about 1950-something. Also, as I've just pointed out, as the thing, without, if the Japanese do not attack Pearl Harbor, do not declare war on America, Hitler won't declare war on America. In which case, the Americans are really sucked for trying to get involved in World War II. They're going to have to either do it, or they're going to have to, you know, they, they'll have to do it by having a vote to go to war. They don't have any national outrage, any hurt, any trauma to, you know, feed into their their war fighting effort, they just have a decision to go to war. And look at World War One, where they vacillated for years. Plus, it's like £250. Plus, yes, um, it is like £250 plus. <laughs> the, the Imperial Museum is consistent in their pricing. They're extortionate. So attacking Singapore doesn't help them in a war against America directly, other than perhaps causing America to have to keep out of the war even longer. Because America might work themselves up into a plava over the stab in their back of the British by the Japanese and how evil the Japanese were for that, but how much is that going to help things? How much is it going to help things? They're gonna. It's gonna be months before they. They're not gonna join World War Two in December 1941. The best they'll do is join by June 1942, if not June 1943. Claire Clark. Read the way the Canadians fought wars. I know I'm late to party. The settler colonial setting is by its nature a breeding ground for savagery. Uh, there are lots of issues with them. I, I've had the similar talk with Lynn Stewart at times. And at some point, I do have to get a specialist naval historian on to talk, uh, a specialist Canadian uh, naval historian friend of mine on to talk about the fact that the Canadian, Canada's um, uh, in, increasingly interesting um, violence whenever they're in war zones. Tim O'Neill, interesting take about the West Coast. My dad enlisted right after Christmas 1941, went to Fort Leonard, off OD, OOD for basic, and off to Washington State Coast and State and Coastal Artillery. Cool.
Blaine's Fox is a World War II debate for the 1942 midterms. Exactly. Simply put, attacking Singapore could give Japan actually more time before the Americans get involved and actually make the American allow them to make the American position worse. Because if they attack Singapore, if they attack if they leave the Philippines, but they attack the Dutch East Indies. Think about it. They could encircle the American forces in the Philippines very quickly. And never touch the Philippines. They could take the Vichy. Fr uh, they could take Vichy France's v uh, Vietnam, like they did historically. Indochina, they took. They could ta uh, take Malaya. They did that. Take Singapore. Take the Dutch East Indies. <sighs> what do the Americans do? They haven't attacked them. They can't attack without permission from Congress. How protected was San Francisco? Could the battleship cruisers sail close enough to bomb the city area? Probably could do. Now, Verdun, yeah, Hitler might be going to declare war in the US in the next six months. Might be going to do that. But the thing is, he won't do that in December 1941. And the thing is, if the Japanese manage to secure all of this and build themselves up, without having the instantaneous effect of the American submarine arm. And remember, it's the American submarine force which buys the Americans the first few months of war. Imagine what happens to the Japanese. We might, we might well have been waiting a while. It actually gets even worse if you have this next target. Why is Sydney worse? Because Australia, again, isn't protected by America. Not part of the, like the Philippines. It's supposedly part of the British Empire, but they are right at the end of the British Empire. And Britain only has so many resources to go around. And Australia is providing a lot of those resources in North Africa in various campaigns. Their troops are critical. Their forces are critical. Attack them, and suddenly Britain has to race forces to the other side of its empire, or it has to abandon someone who's a core ally. And America can't get involved again because America isn't there to protect Australia. That's Britain's job. Attacking Malaya. Attacking Singapore, that's expected. Go and do an attack on Sydney whilst you're launching the attacks elsewhere, down the sort of Malaya, etc., along the uh, sort of along Indochina and into the into the Dutch East Indies, and you will cause absolute panic. If it is UK Japan fight in 1941, do we see the RN stripping all possible subs from the other theaters for deployment to India and Australia? I think the Royal Navy would have to uh, probably would have to. They did historically take submarines from the Atlantic and the Mediterranean. They didn't take as many from the Mediterranean as they took from the Atlantic theaters to go to the Far East. But you have to remember there is quite a lot of significant Royal Navy submarine force deployed to the far, uh, deployed to Australia. It's one of the often forgotten things. There's actually quite a lot of Austra uh, quite a lot of Royal Navy submarines operating out of Australia, as well as American submarines. Man, uh, Phillips is an Australian orderly screaming to his church to get their troops with soldiers back. Pretty much, because they're worried about being attacked by Japan. And this is the scenario. This is a very scary scenario. Again, you don't get the Americans charging out like stupid people across the uh, whole Pacific. 
but you could actually cause far more troubles for Britain and again when does America get involved in the war and when America does get involved in the war they are heading into an even more firmed up area because if imagine if Japan has had six months to firm up the positions in the Dutch East Indies in Malaya all around the Philippines without being attacked they managed to firm up all their positions in those islands without being attacked. They have six months to build up their strength. Six months to get fuel out of them. Six months to get start the resources going. This means no scrap iron flotilla. Scrap iron flotilla is already in the Mediterranean. This is 1941, remember. Again, World War II has been going since, well, 1939 if you started according to European dates earlier if you include China. So, war is already going on. War is very much going on. The Australians have large amounts of forces deployed around the British, around the war fighting. Fighting in North Africa, fighting in the Mediterranean. Graham, could Richard really would have had headaches? Could it have even possibly knocked us out of the war? It wouldn't have knocked Britain out of the war. It probably wouldn't have knocked the Australians out of the war because honestly, the Australians, if you attack them, are going to get absolutely hopping mad. I mean, they're, they're, they're like the Americans in that perspective. As actually attack the Australians, good lord, help you. Someone, please get between you and the emus, um, let alone the humans. Uh, it's just, it's, it, it, they're going to be hopping mad. It's just going to cause even more strain on the British. Absolutely massive strain. And honestly, the thing is, it's going to make Churchill's decision again of pausing the capital ships and carriers even look even more stupid. And as I've said, I, I, as I've said before, when I've talked about that decision, it was made in the uh, sort of the idea of World War One when the Royal Navy hadn't had a, a ongoing escort program and a production program for escorts. The fact is they have those programs running in the beginning of World War One, the World War Two. So you don't need to do the, you don't need to do it so much. You might want to emphasize them, but you don't need to do a pause capital ships will focus only on these things production line. You don't need to do that. Could we see South Africa increasing its participation if its troops were sent to Japanese theatres rather than against Germany in this scenario, given its internal politics? Potentially, but you also... There, there are other issues with South Africa. But they might be forced to. Basically, I think one of the scenarios you could see is a lot more mobilisation of the African troops. Uh, they are, a lot of them are mobilised. It's one of the undertold stories of World War Two. It's something which I'm really hoping that... Um, World War Two TV, I, I will cover at some point. I know he's been working on this subject, but the African troops in the World War in World War Two and the the large numbers of troops who from Africa who were recruited who fought in various theaters in World War Two, um, even for especially for the British, I think are unknown, and I think in this scenario would be even more. No, it would be actually would be known more because they would be even more visible. <laughs> Yeah, Richards, you're talking about Darwin as in the biologist. I think people talk about Darwin as in the place in Australia. So, um, yeah, you know.
Poor Emma still wasn't a strong enough animal to fight Churchill. Unfortunately, Henderson was dead. And Cunningham was in a Mediterranean. Black House was dead. Pound was in charge, but he had so much to deal with. It's not so much you need a strong enough admiral, you need a strong enough admirals to fight Churchill. You need someone to make the case for the Navy's production, which is the Third Sea Lord. And the trouble is, Fraser was too new in post. In the coming on, Indian pilots in the Royal Air Force during the Battle of Britain seem to be one of the best known unknown participants. I know. The amount of video and the amount of books which say unknown participants and it's about the Indian pilots. They deserve the attention. It's just I I think once you're onto the fifth or sixth book, I'm not sure if you can still call them unknown. Um <laughs> I would say more likely the often forgotten or over overlooked. The most overlooked is how I would describe the Indian pilots. There again, there's a whole, we were, uh, Britain was alone, what, with the whole empire behind us. Yes, but Britain fought on alone. A whole empire, but yeah, Britain was alone. So. In the Australia. And here is the other option. Don't attack. Just declare war. Just declare war. Don't actually launch any hidden attack. Don't do anything like that. Just declare war. Make a big, flowery statement of it. Say, you have pushed us so far, you have dishonoured us so much of your statements, etc. And just declare war. The thing is, for the Americans, that would be a very cold start. Yes, they've had war declared on them, but they've almost been cast as a villain in a statement, and whilst they try and spin that as much as they could, it's going to cause trouble. And especially if Japan just declares war, but then doesn't launch an attack, just holds their forces ready. What did the Americans do? Well, the Americans have to go and attack them, or are they fighting a war where no one makes a move towards, you, towards the other? Provides no fire for the Americans to ignite and charge after them. But also provides for a O. Oh. Because do the Americans immediately slip into war plan orange? But the Philippines aren't under attack. Do the Americans go on the offensive? That's not going to exactly look that noble or brave, is it? When they haven't even been attacked, when... Basically, they've been said, your treatment has forced us to declare war, so we declare war on you. Thank you, Bidron. It, you know, it... Very quickly... Is quite a problematic thing for the Americans to deal with. Because if the Americans go on the offensive, you've got all that fuel you haven't used for those operations. The Americans have to go on the offensive if you're going on the offensive. How can the Americans stand on the offensive and do a counterattack if you don't attack them? They have to attack you. And are the Americans in this scenario going to wait around for their resources to be built up or are they going to come attack you? They're going to come attack you. And the thing is, 
you could hold off. You could hold off and let them get really close. I'm talking really, really close to Japan. Let them come for you. Let them get really, really into your backyard. And then use your submarines to cut their logistics line. Your destroyers and cruiser forces to try and trip them at night. And then try and destroy them. As Carl Gasper, well, Carl we know you only look, only need an excuse to attack us. Now you don't need it. Attack us. It's also, if you think about it, kind of a power move because if you're saying we are so confident, do we? You know, you can attack us. We're ready. I would, if I'd be them, I'd be tempted to put in the fa a fact sheet about the Yamato class included in it. And have it solicited as having four of them, or with 18 inch guns and up their speed a bit and all sorts of things, and just watch the Americans go, ah! <laughs> we made your life easy. We knew you were going to attack us at any moment you had the chance, so please do attack us. Just remember, we have these as our battleships. What do the Americans do? You know, they, they go on the offensive. That's great, but how are they justifying that to their people? How are they selling this to their people? Yes, Japan has declared war on them, but Japan has done nothing and has put the blame squarely on them. And I am not certain that you get to manage to uh, control enough of the news, even in 1941 America. Let alone you would today, but not and definitely not in, in, not alone in 1941 America. That that would not echo around America and become a massive point of debate and discussion in the 1942 elections. Eighty six in the chat. It's our record. Um, it's quite nice. Thank you. Don't worry. American pride and ignorance only made Pearl Harbor so much worse. Yeah. Did Japan still take Guam? In the Australia attack, uh, they certainly do take Papua New Guinea. In the, this scenario, what they do is they wait for the Americans to come to them. Because the Americans will probably still will charge them. And then they attack on the counterattack. They literally let the Americans come to them. They attack the American forces. Hopefully cause enough damage that they can get past them. And then attack everything else. Hi, Steve Clark. How much did uh, German early success influence the Japanese decision to attack? Third member of the Axis, but we're not actually in the war as such. Honestly, the Japanese are only loosely members of the Axis. Honestly, the Japanese and the Germans and the Italians. It's a very interesting relationship. Um, the phrase one of my professors used when describing it to me, and he should probably know because... Um, His parents were alive at the time in Japan. Was birds of a feather, a feather often flock together. He loved that British phrase. He loved that one. And basically his view was that they were going together because they had similar views in the world in terms of their view of democracy. And their view of being wronged by the treaties post-World War One. That was what had caused them, caused them to come together. Not anything solidly binding. <laughs> Gareth Britt, the Axis are housemates rather than friends. I would go even so far as to say they are colleagues rather than friends, let alone housemates. 
Housemates, housemates means that they actually live together and share something. Colleagues means they just share a same space during certain hours of the day when they're paid to be there. Otherwise, you know. Don't worry. With the those airfields and Solomon's, US would have waited even longer before attacking. Seriously, Guadalcanal forced their time over. Could they not risk losing US all day shipping? Yeah. And if the Japanese just don't attack, what are the Americans going to do? They, the Americans will probably have to uh, start fighting a war against them, but it's going to be a very weird war. You've just had the war declared on you, and the opponent has done nothing. They haven't attacked you. They're waiting for you to attack them. It automatically turns, well, yes, they've declared war, but they've said they've declared war because we're going to declare war on them anyway and they're fed up with waiting for it. And the moment now we attack them, we turn into the aggressor. It's a... It's going to be a difficult problem for the Americans with the 1942 elections. It's going to be a different problem, with, a problem for the Americans with the various elections coming up. And yes, they can't allow Australia to be isolated. They can't allow, you know, Britain doesn't won't allow Australia to be isolated. They'll both sacrifice forces for it. But the scenario in this one, Australia's not being isolated. No one's being isolated. Japan are not attacking. They're still fighting and probably doing stuff in China, but they're doing nothing else other than declare war on the Americans. They haven't declared war on Britain. They haven't declared war on Australia. They haven't declared war on anyone else. They've just declared war on America. Does Germany even do anything? Because after all, if Pearl Harbor's not launched, does Hitler want to get involved in a war against America right now? Or does he want to wait a few months? Does he want to wait and see what the Americans do? This is a scenario where you could really jam up the American political and decision-making process with just this move. Post-war politics in this scenario would be super weird. You have no idea, Blackman Maximus. I have had students war game this out. And this scenario caused them to... A few of them to actually sit down and... Working through it, the amount of permutations of things which can go differently. And what the Americans have to... Because again, the Americans don't launch a Doolittle raid in this scenario. They don't do anything like that. What are they going to do? They've just been declared war on. The Japanese have done absolutely nothing other than declare war. What do they do? The most obvious thing is send reinforcements to the Philippines. But if you're sending reinforcements to the Philippines, the Japanese can interdict that because of the islands they have control of. So you're going to need to have that heavily escorted. So you end up with a major fleet scenario of kind of similar to... The Mediterranean convoys going to the Philippines. And that's a disaster waiting to happen. If you consider American tactics for dealing with torpedo along views on long range torpedo strikes and the likely movement of such a large convoy and the Japanese night operations. You create a sort of phony, na uh, phony, uh, a phony war, yes. Coming so Japan is the UK and USA is Germany, 1939, this scenario. Yeah, where Britain doesn't really do much, just weird. But there again, Britain is clearing the seas of German forces, so they're hunting them down in, you know, uh, in the River Plate, etc., all sort of the South Atlantic. In the ocean. Think about US would just move to reinforce and upgrade Guam, Wake, and Philippines. And the thing is, those convoys they become very attractive targets for the Japanese. So the thing is, 
What it, it, this maneuver actually almost presents the best scenario for the Japanese to attrit American forces. Because you don't attack the Philippines, you don't attack Guam, you don't attack Wake. You attack the convoys sent out to reinforce them. So they're going to have to send more convoys to reinforce them. Or they're going to have to leave them to starve. Which is not an option. If you consider you're turning those islands, those areas, into far higher population versions, in terms of the Philippines, especially far higher population versions, of Malta. Far more exposed versions of Malta. In many regards. Under this scenario, you make it an absolute nightmare for the Americans. And yes, you can point out, well, the Americans have cracked Japanese codes. So they know this scenario. So they can deal with this. Well, the thing is, can they? Because whilst the Americans have cracked Japanese codes, the Japanese are certainly doing their best on American codes as well. And whilst they don't always have the information advantage, it requires far less effort to set up ambush forces than it does to coordinate attacking forces. Jabok, they need Indonesian oil. You are quite right. They do need Indonesian oil. But there are other ways to go around getting that than necessarily invading. There are other ways to go around getting that necessary than invading. More importantly, there are also other sources of oil. You can buy it off the Russians. You, can, whilst they don't have, whilst they only have a peace agreement with them as of 1939, they do have a peace agreement. They could buy oil off the Russians. There are other potential sources that they could go to. <laughs> The US didn't want to use convoys and was not aware if IJ uh, long outs and night, night tactics. Well, the trouble is, yeah, but you're not going to send... The thing is, the US doesn't want to use convoys for merchant shipping. But if you're sending reinforcements, i.e. a lot of troops, you're going to convoy them. And a lot of military stores, you're going to convoy them, especially if you're sending them into a war zone. So even though they don't want to do convoys for merchant ships, they'll do convoys in this scenario. So their warships and their merchant ships will be sailing in predictable patterns. Especially if you consider the Americans don't like the zigzag at this point. So just think of the massacre that could happen if the Americans aren't zigzagging. So, and I have to admit, I will apologise, I am running this slightly quicker than I normally do. I'm hoping I can make up on Sunday by just doing a any questions session of brewship. So if I miss anything and I don't answer questions today, please do ask me on Sunday. But for obvious reasons today, I am running a bit faster than I normally do. Normally these are about three hours long, three hour, three and a half hour long videos. This is probably going to be a two to two and a half hour long video. The free Dutch need money to buy the US weapons and why not off the, uh, uh, get off the Japanese? Potentially. Especially if it can be done quietly. And by the guy in uh, 9, they probably would try that. But again, here is another problem for the Americans. If the Japanese haven't declared war on the British and haven't declared war on the, war on the uh, Vichy French and and taken Indochina and haven't done any of that, or have taken Indochina and haven't attacked the Dutch, then are the Dutch or the British or the Australians going to give the Americans basing in their territories? Americans don't have basing in those territories. Where can their submarines reach?
the moron. Those US Navy formations trying to reinforce the West Pacific base will be picked apart. Exactly. Uh, in the time treatment, I have visions. Current Royal Navy ship captain has a dream about World War II and immediately orders the ship to zigzag. I only remember that the ship is already is because World War II has only been over for 80 years. Don't joke. The Royal Navy still does practice zigzagging. They still do. Um, it was actually... There is... I'm not 100% sure of the story, but the first exercise the task group did when they formed up around Queen Elizabeth for the first time was zigzag manoeuvres. When they formed up with Royal Navy ships as a of Royal Navy task group. And one of the first test exercises they did when they in sort of op group manoeuvring exercises they did once they had allied ships in there was zigzags. And the American and the... Uh, the I think it was the American and the... Uh, I forget who, who supplied the other ship in the task group. Basically went, thank you. We didn't know where we didn't realize we were we would, we would return to World War Two. <sighs> well, the British have heard this idea of goods for bases. Can't think of where from. Yes, they do have this idea, but that would be joining another war. Did the British really want to join a war against Japan at this precise time? Problems. How long before the uh, sorry, the Japanese attack the Dutch East Indies and Malaric? Basically, they wait till they've attrited quite a lot of American forces in those convoys, and then they go for it. So you probably have a few months before they do so. So there's always a chance that something like the sinking the Lusitania, if Japan declares war without attacking, some torpedoes a U.S. flagged liner with U.S. civilians being evacuated from the Far East. Potentially, but where are those civilians being evacuated from? Are they being evacuated from Japan? Or are they being evacuated from China? Where are they being evacuated from? Because, again, think about this in war scenario. You wouldn't be evacuating civilians from Japan because that's... In nicest way, you you don't the civilians don't get out in that scenario; they get interned. Um, same for Japanese territories, and there's really not a line as worth of civilians sitting in other areas. As for how they get uh, how they get civilians off, you know, places like the Philippines, etc. Honestly, they might have to go to the British and ask them to hire some ships. Some British flagships to go over there. Because the British will be neutral in this war to take the civilians away. Which the British probably will do for a hefty amount of money. See, if Britain says they will join the war, uh, join the U.S. versus Japan war, if the U.S. joins the war, against, would that have happened? Potentially, potentially, but the power's going to be in Churchill's corner there, and goodness knows what deal he'll want to strike. So, honestly, the summary, um, I'm, you know, it's worthwhile considering in terms of this front. Pearl Harbor for the Japanese couldn't have gone worse on a strategic level. It goes great on a tactical level. Woohoo! We sink ships! But on a strategic level. It fires up the Americans, but the knives and the forces to come charging at them. So the Americans have to adapt their tactics as they were inclined to anyway, but let's be honest. If they had more forces able to work and viable, then the politicians would probably have been pushing for a quicker prosecution of war. Look at how the Americans go absolutely crazy, the American politicians, for the the frigging raid they do with their the little raid with the B-25s. It's just... That is the most... Look at the risks that's run with that. That's... 
50% of your carrier force. One carrier is not able to do anything other than launch the B-25s. And you're sending them over there to do that, which is just basically a token operation. And you're sacrificing those crews and those planes. Think about how rational, how emotional that is in an organization. Yeah, you can consider it this great operation. It's... Kind of, uh, kind of like a, corn, a cornerstone of the uh, of the movie Pearl Harbor, because if it hadn't been for the actually nice guy in that dying in that operation, then there wouldn't have been any way for the hero to marry the heroine and raise the nice guy's child. I think it it was a really weird movie, Pearl Harbor, in so so many ways. But leaving that to one side. The fact is, that's not the reaction of a hard, you know, a logical person thinking through. Because that's a, not a, that's a waste of resources in many ways. You can argue strategic benefits of the new little raid and all those things. Oh yeah, it scared the Japanese. It made them focus more on home defense and all these things. Yeah, it has limited effects on that. They're already paranoid enough about home defense as it was. Is it in purely for the emotion of saying, We struck back! They hit American soil, we've hit Japanese soil. So they had a full battle fleet, and they felt they hadn't been uh, they hadn't been as damaged as they were in this operation. You can imagine what they would have done. They would have gone for it. They would have gone for it. And then Japan could have treated them. Then Japan might have stood a chance of destroying the first American fleet. They wouldn't have destroyed the second one which came, or the third one which came. But they, they, you know, they might have actually succeeded in their strategic planning. Well, there is one thing. Roosevelt would not have had Great Churchill over barrel when, as he did when it did happen. True. Then remember, Roosevelt wanted to get into the war, but it was so politically untenable for the US elections, so he could not go to war with Germany at that time. No, thanks, thanks for Hitler, who declared war on him. Coming on, in this scenario, two allies are unlikely to get folded into Manhattan until much later. If at all, so both projects will be delayed. True. Don't wrong, no damage to oil tanks, dry dock support facilities. One of the interesting things about what's being built in Pearl Harbor is what's built after the uh, after the attack on Pearl Harbor in terms of finished off is far greater than what was there beforehand. So you're like, the US will still be a battleship fleet, the big gun animals will still be in charge, and relegate the aircraft carriers to supporting, scouting and support? Yes and no. The Americans have had, again, the Americans are kind of like the British, they've had enough, they're a large enough organisation, they have a lot of ideas at the top, and they are a broad enough church that they ha are able to have this different concepts. Plus you have to remember where, um... <sighs> Oh, brain engage. <sighs> da -da -da -da. Oh, what's his name? Pearl Harper. <sighs> you have to remember that um, Admiral Kimmel, he comes from the reconnaissance arm of the US Navy. He comes from the section which has been using aircraft carriers. He is he is the guy he'll be in the guy in charge if they don't don't attack Pearl Harbor if they don't if the fleet doesn't get sunk so he's uh, his prevention motors has protected it and he would take his fleet out on attack and he is a he is a very much a carrier admiral so I would not say about this relegating the carriers in any way Tim O'Neill West Coast was in a panic over Japanese attack on Hollywood true. The West Coast is often in a panic over stuff. <laughs> mm. 
Now, and lots of slow and upgraded battleships to drink all that fuel. Yes, there is, and that's going to cause trouble with their movements and slow them down. Admiral Fletcher, wouldn't be relegated to the Aleutians? Probably not. But going on, does the US build all six hours and the Montanas have to carry a show in its, uh, show its power battleship early in the war? Now, here is the thing. It's going to depend on how it happens. If the Japanese strike the Americans down with their carriers and absolutely wallop, wallop them with just their naval aviation, yes. However, if the Japanese soften them up with their naval aviation and the destroyers and then finish them off with their battle line led, led by the Yamato and Mashashi, that's going to be a very different matter because that's going to show the supremacy of the battleship. Look, they came in and they destroyed us. Not they delivered the coup de grace. They destroyed us. Look at how big their guns are. They're so big and girthy. And long! It's just, they're so big! Their guns are so big! They would, you know, the, yeah, the, you'd get the Montanas and the Iowas built in this way. If that happens, you get the Montanas and the Iowas both entirely built. In, entirely built. I've done a whole video on Kimmel, so I'm gonna leave that to one side, but he was wronged. Uh,. Everyone, it could be worse. This is for Pearl. Drops a bomb after having frigating already pulled up when you wouldn't damage the carrier and the blast would kill you. Uh, I'm not getting into that one. I am not getting into that movie. Honestly, that's a good way to cause me. And um, if if you challenge the ship shaped crew to watch that movie together, and we had to take a drink of our favorite drink. Every time we spotted a mistake in that movie and a historical inaccuracy, I would get for about f eight liters of iron brew in the whole video and probably cause Dan to be absolutely panicking about my kidneys. Um, I'm not sure how long it would take for the torpedo juice to probably stop Drac being able to coherently say anything, but I think it would probably be a couple of it would probably be the first few seconds because that's how quickly he'd down a glass of it. Um, Dan, oh, what does Dan usually like? Dan, remind me what your favorite drink is. It's isn't it, was it cider? No, is it wine? Uh, it could be cider or wine. I'm not sure. I've seen you order both quite a lot. Um, Either way, he will probably not survive the, the, the whole bit of the whole movie. Yeah, it will, and even Garius the Brit, if he's still watching, I, I have great faith in your ability to drink beer. I know you do have capabilities in that area, but I still think that movie would be more than your your exhaustive capacity could handle. <laughs> beer, yeah, from Dan, yeah. I'm not seeing Waterloo. I, I'm avoiding Napoleon. I'm avoiding anything to do with Napoleon. Um, it, it, it's no, it just no. Back when one, if the Americans push forward in the just declare war scenario, they, then with a few upgraded battleships and ex and experience. Uh, and inexperienced air crews, it could be very troubling for any American Pacific fleet against the IGN. It could be fun. Actually, well Admiral King was also in charge of US Carrier Division at one some point. He was in charge of all sorts of things. He had an interesting career, King did. For the year of the Admiral, which is... I think the year of the Admiral is the year after the year of the Carrier. I think so. Uh, or it might be... I might be doing the year of Logistics then. I'm not sure. Um... Yeah, King's going to be an interesting one to profile. Uh, K 
Okay. Back on, with a battleship attack towards Cat Japan, even with carry support, and you are likely to see the standard sunk without a hope of recovery. Yeah, West Coast was pot fully populated. Um, but I remember, culturally, America cannot allow themselves to be outgunned. Uh, honestly, I, I think the biggest problem you have is probably USS Texas. Because if any ship is going to want to single-handedly try and take on Yamato and Mushashi, if she's in that battle line, is going to be Texas. And either, where, either they don't manage to sink her because she's Texas and she has almost as much plot armor as Warspite, or she gets sunk, in which case you might end up with an Iowa or a Montana, which is named Texas. Just want to put that one out there. Or even new class of battleships named Texas, or a new Texas class battleships um, that come after them. Similarly, so the American 3D printer kick in if the Japanese don't attack. They do if they lose the first round. <laughs> so if the Yamato UK observes the Yamato smashing the standards, do we see Vanguard and the sisters speed built? Even the UK not in part, part of war. Uh, I'd say Vanguard and the Lions speed built. The Lions, which I held up constantly with various random reasons. Lions stories kind of like HMS Argentine in World War One, the sixth Queen Elizabeth class. There are so many weird things going on there about excuses for why they're not being built that it you start to realise that they're literally just keeping the, them in a position where they can quickly build them if they need to, but they're not going to build them because they want to wait and see how the tech works out and see if they need to build them. So basically, they're just keeping them on ice. Um, with Argincourt, there's all sorts of weird things about that ship, seriously. Um, but with... Yeah, with the the lions, I swear they're just keeping them on ice. Can't rank one. The only thing I've uh, against Kimmel really, and again, I was through forty two. Trust these trained radar guys you've heard for service is what they're doing. Well, Kimmel did. The trouble is they weren't on duty, and more importantly for Kimmel is he, the he's not getting the, read into the intelligence briefings. The you know his previous command, uh, the previous admiral had been read into the intelligence briefings, and because he'd been disagreeing with the uh, disagreeing with Roosevelt based on those intelligence briefings, they decided not to give Kimmel the intelligence information. Instead of going, you know what, he needs to see the same information. They actually cut him out. So that is one of the problems for Kimmel with all those things. Guys, I'm not watching this message. Just think that. Nature, Dan is already worried about your kidneys. Drac would probably offer for beer or cider in some type of juice. At least, uh, or at least grog for that one. Potentially. <laughs> nice Fox. I discovered a hell for a historian. Make them a consultant Michael Bay historical movie. Uh, that's probably still better than a Ridley Scott one. Because apparently, according to Ridley Scott, historians, uh, the, the, what historians do in history is read a book and then write it down, write down what they read. Uh, no. I'm not getting into that. There have been other, uh, other YouTube historians, etc. So, you know, other people who communicate on social media who have ripped into pieces far more successfully than I will be inclined to because I don't really see the point. He's a movie, he, he's a movie director. He's he views himself as an artiste. He's not doing historical documentary. He's doing a work of fiction. He's just named some of the fictional characters after real people. You can tell that because Marshall Ney would never have sported a beard. But I'll leave that to one side. Um, if you want to see a very, very good version of Marshall Ney and Napoleon, there are older movies from the, the 60s and 70s which are very good. The, 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 look... One of the things you learn very quickly when you look at a lot of modern historical movies is they are far more about telling the story which the directors and the writers want to tell than they are about telling the history. This is why Band of Brothers was so good. This is why The Pacific was so good. Because they focused on the history so much over the story. Whereas a lot of the modern movies are focusing on the story over the history. And you can see that in their selections and what's going on. And I... Look, I just don't care. I I don't watch them. That's that's my view. Is if I know I'm going to be annoyed by it because I'm a historian, so historic accuracy matters a lot to me. 
I don't see the point in watching something which is just going to give me stress problems. I usually stick to sci-fis, but at the moment I'm currently avoiding Doctor Who because that keeps having interesting things with history because of its time travels premise. So I tend to stick to the sci-fis which are the more science fiction sci-fis, up in space, etc. That's right. No lovers were harmed in making of this review. Please send help. I was asking. I watched Pearl Harbor in a rural cinema in during holidays in another country. Kind of cringy and full of pixelated like CGI. Ooh. I've seen Dra I saw Drac having a wine tour in a cellar near Tokash, and then some. Was a tad tired, and I mean only a tad. Yep. So what's the ideal film? <laughs> you know what? Yeah. Let's put it this way. The Americans, like most countries, have a different attitude over things happening to them versus them doing things to other people. Most countries seem to have that level of um, line and sand going. <laughs> If the IGN battleships finished with the American fleet, it would have led to a greater amount of pressure to keep battleship production going after the war. Oh, yes. There would have been that whole thing of, battleships do work and they do have a place in a modern war. It would just have been, yeah, fun. Shouldn't you be wrapping this up, Doc? Um, I will be in a... It's a I've, I'm going to say about ten minutes. It's going to be about two and a half hours. As I said, normally it's three to three and a half hours. It's being about an hour shorter tonight. <laughs> By going, if the amateurs kill your standards, did the Montanans get upgraded to the US 18 inch 48 cal gun that the US was testing? Um, potentially not, but as said, potentially Texas's get produced. And they might well be armed with an 18 inch 50 cal or something even bigger. Because they would want to go for the biggest gun possible for the next generation USS Texas. I mean, just imagine. I, I'm, I'm not saying that they would potentially open up the uh, Tillman battleship. Designs and start going, let, can we modernize one of these? A you know, bit of standard. And does it have to go through the Panama Canal? We can redesign the Panama Canal to take it. Um, I'm just saying, it will be big and it will be scary and it will be beautiful. <laughs> Mamos, take a shot of Monster Energy Drink every time there's a historical inaccuracy in a Pearl Harbor movie. I have no desire to never sleep again. I drink iron brew and coke like it's going out of fashion. I If I drink... Uh, that's Coca-Cola, by the way. Coke. That version. Uh, if I drank Monster Energy Drink the same way, I would never sleep again. Because what little sleep I am inclined to have would be overridden by that amount of caffeine. <laughs> Excellent. War and Peace, where they Russian version version, where they get the Romanian army to fight the Battle of Borodino versus the Russian army. It's always nice to have the Romanian army to help out. Can I turn around 18 inch 50 cal in that amount of time? This is the American industrial complex. If they if they put their t effort into it, they can make it. How good it is is nothing matter. But let's be honest, they they'll give they'll put a lot of effort into it. And it is a built up gun they're using. So actually, making a built up gun longer, whilst it's not easy, it's theoretically possible. And if it's theoretically possible, if you're prepared to spend a lot of money, 
The Americans in World War II, if they had seen their ships get sunk, would be prepared to spend a lot of money. <laughs> Tailman 4 2, 10 of them. Oh lord, help us, no. Not that. Why? Good lord, do you, do you have any idea how many. That, 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 what kind of firepower you be taking in the battle? I must have 30 knot long tanner with triple 18 inch 48s. Moroccan mm. <laughs> a modern retelling of Brown Rose will be far more pro sable and focus more on the breakdown suffered by many a second. Uh, uh. Look, it was a very good one on the 101st, and frankly, the fact, uh, what I would say about the Band of Brothers, I've always pointed out, is look at the sheer amount of accolades the actors involved in that have gone on to achieve. The sheer quality of acting talent they got together for that one mo that one program. And then look at modern programs and go, are you amassing that sheer amount of talent? Just it's the sheer amount of outlay to do that sort of thing today is probably what rules it out as happening. <laughs> All right, and I'm going to say final questions because I'm going to go in five minutes. Well, actually, when I say go, I'm going to quickly pop onto Amazon and buy some Kindle books because I have a feeling I'm going to need them tonight because I'm going to be sitting next to probably a sleeping mother for several hours. But, you know, that's fine. That's what you do. She's currently still she's still staying in A&E because mm, A&E are worried about which ward they're going to put her into. How many Band of Brothers Europe, uh, Band of Brothers Europe were Brits? Uh, there's quite a lot of Brits there. Uh, which one? Uh, Band of Brothers has even had the extras have been leads in major franchises. Yep. Yeah, Grain Shell was another of those programs. By the way, if you haven't ever seen Grain Shell, which you probably haven't if you're an American or here, it was actually a very... For a long time, Grain Shell was a very good... Uh, sort of... Early afternoon for kids going out of school, school drama. And for many years, it was very good. Along with Biker Grove, if you want to pick up a Geordie accent and you want to see where Anton Deck have come from... If you've just you've seen them occasionally on the on television and internet and gone, where have these two people come from? Biker Grove, disturbingly good source of talent and disturbingly good television at certain points. Mummy, I completely by mistake ended up in the town the five and six trained in, and the skeleton museum they moved the horse stable into. Cool. I'd recommend my books, but I fear my current series is very much not your speed. Hmm. It don't take us the wrong way, but the books I'll be looking for for this evening are going to be ones which are enjoyable, light reads. Where I don't have to turn my brain on. So, probably, I haven't yet got the full collection of Ronald Dahl in, in um, or Harry Potter in Kindle version, so I might well add to those. <laughs> the urchins. <sighs> hmm. Not sure about that. We have YouTube. We have YouTube. I do sometimes wonder if there is a grand conspiracy to make YouTube more attractive to people to watch. I'm not sure if Google is somehow paying everyone to produce terrible television so more people watch YouTube. But I really can't argue against it because I wouldn't have, at the moment, 
Uh, I would call this gainful employment, as far as I'm concerned, because I managed to fill my working allocation and my allocation of daily hours towards working, mostly with YouTube. Occasionally with some universities I go to, I uh, teach, you know, once or twice a month at maximum. But, um, yeah. If it wasn't for YouTube... I would be seriously, seriously at a loss of what to do. So I, I am I'm very glad of it. But I'm sure there is no real conspiracy theory of Google paying people to produce bad movies and television to drive them to YouTube. Cosmos, I don't get if Skins was a drama or a comedy. I found it hilarious, but they seem too serious. I decided Skins was... A drama with comedic elements. Although we're getting into a random bit of history. But again, the, the cast of skins have gone on to some really amazing things. <laughs> Thank you, Colin Garon. I should have done. Hey, just Fernan, don't take us the wrong way, but it's lighter reading for me. I, a few years ago, was help volunteering with various teams writing reports into potential genocides. I've done all sorts of random things around my field. Harry Potter is not that dark compared to some of the stuff I've written, let alone the stuff I've read. Georgian, today I found an extended cut of 96 Midway recorded off of Australia. Uh, complete with commercial breaks and uploaded to the Internet Archive. Cool. <laughs> I just don't watch it. 96031, that's far easier than not questioning it, just not watching it. Because I'm uh, my brain doesn't turn off, so I can't not question things. So I just don't watch it, and that's easier. <laughs> I could do. I could just got, that is something which I've got considering for next year, because talking about aircraft carriers, you've got to start talking about a visual representation of media. <laughs> Thank you, Carl Gazzard. Right, then. Uh, what have we got coming up? I'm just going to sort of flick through these. Well, I've got for all the Year of Technology videos. I haven't started on the ones which are supposed to be taking over the Tuesday slots yet because they're supposed to be the Australia video ship videos and I haven't managed to sort all that out yet because I've had a fun week, but I will get there. What have we got next week? Next week we have... Well, on Sunday we have how a battleship auto uh, warship autoloader turrets prototyped a developmental history. I will have that presentation ready for Sunday. Um, on Saturday, it should be the Long Patrol for, if not Pearl Harbor, if I've had a chance to record it. And that might also be, uh, Patron 19 might also be the Long Patrol for next, um, for the following Tuesday. And what else do we have coming up in lives? We do have more. Uh, we have the flag class sloops, most key ship of the 20th century. That's going to be a fun one. Coming on top of the Acacia class key ships video. And Patreon 92, Frank Whittle is given control, uh, consistent funding by Britain. Cool. And then on the 28th of December, we have the other 7th of December harbour attack, the Operation Frankton, a.k.a. the Cockle Shell Heroes, which should be fun. And Patreon 93, which is coming up on the... Um, ...4th of January... 
is World War I all, in World War I, all navies dug out the old obsolescent ships in reserve and put them into use. How did it go? How, would he, how useful were they? Old Crocs at War. Just editing that particular title to something nicer. Right. Thank you, John Shea. Thank you, Team Locker. Thank you, Carl Richards. Thank you, um, uh, Richards. Thank you, Carl Gansberg. Thank you, Blackman Maxwell. Thank you, Paul Amos. Have you got all the... I have got all the Sylvan Stewart's books. Um, all the series I read of his... There are some of his series which are just they're just not my type my type of thing to read, but I love his books and I love his writing. And the thing is, I've read some of his series, the even the ones which I are not the type of books because I'm not really a magic in I don't really enjoy magic. The only reason I read Harry Potter as much as I done this I do is because of the sheer amount of cultural references that get made to it. And so you've it sort of got me into it that way. But I've always been more of a science science fiction rather than a magic science fiction, if that makes sense. Thank you, Graham Harner. Thank you, Ms. Morrison. Thank you, Colin Cameron. Thank you, Joss Funk. Thank you, Abzeski. Thank you, George Newman. Thank you, Bugai tonight. And thank you, Dick Richards. Thank you, Scooters. Leslie, the Brock, Colin, Plains Fox, Summit, McDavid. Thank you, everyone. Take care. And um, hope you enjoyed. <laughs> thank you, Ms. Morrison. And uh, yeah, I will. The long patrol for this will hopefully be out Saturday. The long patrol for tomorrow. I have a feeling it's going to end up being part two of the um, the 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 video the the, uh, the reaction video because I don't think I'm going to have time to record the key ships video which was supposed to be covering that and um, yeah thank you everyone take care if I do get time to record the key ships video I will do it because it's a cool, it's a cool topic it's a cool ship to uh, discover and discuss. Thank you very much, everyone. Take care and have fun. Toodles.